In this video lecture, we're going to talk about one-dimensional city-state conduction with thermal energy generation. And then a later video lecture, we'll talk about extended surfaces. So in previous lectures, we've derived temperature profiles using the heat equation for, for systems in one dimension. So we had the plane wall system where we derived the temperature versus x through a plane wall. We had cylindrical systems and spherical systems where we defined temperature versus radius for each of those systems. And now we're going to be covering some of the same type of ideas, except now we're going to be adding in an energy generation term. So an energy generation term is typically described as a volumetric source of generation. So you have watts per cubic meter. And the source of this generation can be electrical generation. So um, you had the energy generated by an electrical resistor, so that'd be current squared times resistance over voltage would give you, or volume, sorry. Current squared times resistance over volume would give you um, the power generated per unit volume. So you might have a metal material and you apply some electrical current to it, and that metal has an electrical resistance, which makes it generate heat. So even though the actual heat source is from an electric source, we can characterize that as a generation of um, a heat generation term in this class. So normally we'll deal with uniformly distributed heat, although there are definitely situations where heat can be non-uniformly distributed. So for example, if you had a absorption of radiation through a semi-transparent medium, meaning so you have radiation coming in and you have some medium here, you have some molecules here that are going to be absorbing radiation. Well, the deeper you get into there, the less and less of that radiative heat is going to make it in there. So you would have a decreasing amount of generation um, as you get, as X gets bigger and bigger. And you'll notice that really the, this isn't um, energy being generated, it's energy being absorbed by radiation. But another way of describing the system would be to to use an equation like this, where you're given the amount of energy absorbed um, as a function of x. So again, you have to be really careful when you're doing these energy balances that you're accounting for things in a consistent way. Are you accounting for radiation as an in term um, coming from the outside, or are you accounting for it as a generation term as it gets absorbed? So in this particular case, the book is giving us a description of a approximating radiation coming into the system as being generated. So let's say we had a plane wall, and now this is a, a plane wall that has generation. So this is the form of the heat equation. So this looks different than what we've looked at previously because we now we have this constant volumetric generation term. But the way we'd go about solving for such a system would be pretty much the same. So we would take the heat equation, we would integrate. Because it's a second order differential equation, we are going to need two different boundary conditions, so one at each surface. But other than that, our, I mean, other than the generation term, our methodology is the same. And because we've already gone through in this class, we've already gone through a couple of temperature profile derivations, hopefully we have the basic idea for how those are produced. And I'll just give you the general solution here. So it's just the same thing we're integrating, um, but in this case we end up getting this term where you have an, you have an x squared in there instead of temperature profile just varying linearly as it does in a plane wall system at steady state with no generation. So because you have this x term in there, um, you get a temperature profile, I mean this x squared term, you get a temperature profile that is nonlinear. So I'll ask you this generic question, what is the form of the temperature distribution when you have no generation, when you have generation greater than zero, or when you have generation less than zero. So this should be fairly trivial. When you have generation is equal to zero, this goes away and you're left with just a linear profile. So this basically reduces to the case of plane wall at steady state, constant thermal conductivity, and no generation, which we know develops a linear temperature profile. If Q is greater than zero, so you have um, you would expect to have higher higher temperatures within the material itself than you might see at the boundaries. 
and if Q were negative, then you might expect to see something that looks like this. So you actually have heat being consumed within the plane wall. So the boundary conditions can be a little bit different. In this case, we were looking at boundary conditions where we know the t surface temperature on each end of the wall, um, but those may not be the boundary conditions you're always dealing with. So other types of boundary conditions can be zero flux at a particular point in the wall. So if you have a symmetrical system where you have a surface temperature that's the same on each side, one boundary condition that you might apply is that the flux right at the center is equal to zero. Because the system is symmetrical, heat's going to be propagating out equally in both directions, and we'd expect for our temperature profile to be symmetrical. So if we can see that in advance, we can apply this constant flux condition where dt dx at x equals to zero is equal to zero, where x is defined from the center of the wall going outward. And actually that same boundary condition applies if one side of the wall is insulated. So now we're basically looking at half of the system, but we would still have d by dx at x equals zero is equal to zero. So effectively, having a symmetrical system, um, if, if you just look at half of the system, that ends up being equivalent to a system that has one side insulated. So the temperature distribution in this particular case ends up looking like this, and no notice that this is no longer um, a generic solution. The constant C1 and C2 have been solved for by applying those different boundary conditions that I just described. So how can you determine what the surface temperature is? Well, you can do an overall energy balance on the wall. So you can do something like Q dot times the volume of the wall is equal to the total amount of heat that's going to be lost by convection times the surface area of the wall. So basically, if it's insulated on one side, we know that all heat generated is going to have to propagate out in this direction. So at steady state, we just take our volumetric generation term, multiply it by a vol the volume term, and we know that that has to be equal to the total amount of energy leaving by convection, if convection is in fact the only mode of heat transfer exiting. There might also be convection plus radiation, or just radiation, or you could have conduction if there's another solid material adjacent to the right side of the wall. So that's one way to solve for the surface temperature. So here is basically that same condition applied where they've substituted in Newton's law of cooling to give you the amount of heat leaving the wall by convection. And this is the amount of heat generated within the wall. So this is one equation. In this case, we would we expect to know everything except for the surface temperature. So by applying this overall energy balance on the wall, we get this very useful equation. We know everything besides the surface temperature, and it's easy to go back and solve for the surface temperature using that equation. So in radial systems, cylindrical and spherical, um, we're solving, again, we're solving the heat equation, but now we have, unlike in previous examples, now we have this constant generation term in there. And so without going through the derivations, I'm just going to um, jump right to the temperature distribution. So here's how the temperature distributions look for um, for cylindrical systems. Oh, sorry, this is a spherical system. So we start with an equation that looks like that, and we, we integrate, we solve, we get these constants of integration, and we end up with a temperature profile that looks like that for a spherical system. And I want to point you to a very nice tool, Appendix C of the book, which, given a certain geometry and certain boundary conditions and certain generation conditions, these temperature profiles are given. But based on the methodology we've applied, where you look at the system, apply the heat equation, and integrate it, um, hopefully you should have a, a pretty good idea, at least, for how these temperature profiles are derived. So Appendix C looks something like this. So the temperature distribution for a plane wall and again, these particular conditions are one-dimensional, steady state. Um, when you have planar, cylindrical, or spherical walls, 
uniform generation and you might have different surface conditions. So you have um, TS1 and TS2 that are at different temperatures. But I encourage you, I realize the resolution here is a little bit bad. I'm just trying to give you a glimpse at what that appendix looks like, but definitely open up your textbook and look at how those temperature profiles, how they are for different systems and different conditions.